John, <laughs> John 8, 1, 2, 11, and it's on page 868 in the Pew Bible. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. We have a verse from Jeremiah 17, it's verse 13, and it's on page 631. Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. May these readings bless our lives today. Thank you, Lynn. Now, I'm going to introduce somebody that I know quite well. It's <laughs> <laughs> Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, David. Beautifully read, Lynn. Wonderful introduction. I've got a question for you. Have you ever been caught in the act? Hopefully not adultery, but perhaps telling a few porkies or misappropriating something not yours. Well, perhaps you got away with it. Well, my, my, my mind goes back probably to like when I was about nine or ten years old and I was eagerly taking my weekly trip to the Christchurch Public Library on a Friday, on a bus, all on my own, and I would exchange my three library books and then take a side trip to uh, Hayes, the friendly school. Does anyone ever remember yes. that from Christchurch? Yes. It had a, a roof with a playground on it, so I used to go up there. And, um, meet Aunt Hazel, who used to entertain the children up there, before I caught the bus in Cathedral Square home. Now just inside the Hayes entrance, there was a very large, long confectionery counter, an island stacked layers of high, with myriads of brightly coloured sweets, packets of sweets, licorice pipes, chocolate bars, sherbet dabs, pink smokers, you can see mouth watering yet, round tree spread guns and other tempting morsels. Oh, beckoning, eat me. So 
I was hungry, and they all looked mouth-watering and delicious. And my sensory receptors were all awakened. No one seemed to be on the counter, so I hatched a cunning plan. I would walk around the counter, make my selection, and then very gently hover my hand over my choice and slip it into my pocket. And very nonchalantly, I'd walk away. So if I started looking left, right, left again, about three times, I walked around this huge island before I could pluck up enough courage to hover, hover as I thought, delicately over this packet of chocolate, whatever it was, I can't remember, packet of temptation up into my pocket and walk away. Then, like a spectre out of nowhere, the shop assistant approached me. That will be, I'll say 10 cents, it was in pennies of course. <laughs> well, I had guilt and shame written all over my face and I stabbed and fished around in my pocket and I found about 8 cents. Uh, I, I, I've only got my bus fare home. <laughs> she fixed her baleful stare at me. Then you'd better put it back, hadn't you? Caught in the act. But today we're looking at another female caught in the act, this time an unnamed woman caught in the act of adultery. Under the law, the sentence to both the man and the woman was the death penalty by stoning. Now, why have I chosen this story? I'm particularly captivated by Jesus' wisdom and command of the situation he finds himself in. The story starts at dawn in the temple, very, very early, so John says in verse 2, where all the people gathered to be taught by Jesus, and he sat down to teach them. How keen were the crowds to come and hear him, to come at dawn? And this, of course, was the perfect time for the scribes and Pharisees who just caught this woman, and they were the scholarly experts, and they wanted to bring her, this, this woman, this fallen woman to Jesus. And, and this was a real event. It wasn't just a theoretical debate. And that woman, that poor woman, is standing there, nameless, terrified, publicly shamed and humiliated, guilty, in view of everyone. The whole group. And facing imminent death. How dreadful. They said to him, Teacher, Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Well, we know they were trying to trap him into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against him. And at the end of this chapter, in verse 58, they're still at it. They're picking up stones there to stone him, the sinless Messiah. But the gospel says that he hid himself. It wasn't his time. If we go back the day before this event, Jesus was at the, on the last day of the festival. He was at the Festival of Tabernacles, the last day, and teaching again. While he was teaching again, the guards tried to seize him then. But the scripture says they couldn't because his time had not yet come. This is quite interesting, I think, in view of our... Um, events and the news events lately, that Hamas deadly terrorist attack on Israel on October 7th, that was the day after the very same festival when the Jews and Christians would have been absolutely celebrating and probably off guard. If we look back at these scriptures in verse 6, we see that Jesus didn't say anything at this point. But he stooped down on the ground and wrote with his finger, as though he didn't hear. So when they continued badgering him and expected him to collude with the whole male collective that was there, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
Now, that's a weird response, isn't it? John tells us that Jesus did it twice. So he's clearly emphasizing it, and it's a gesture that's meant to draw our attention. Yet at the same time, it's very, very strange. Then verse 9 says that those who heard it began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. What was Jesus writing that caused them all to go away and not argue? They didn't argue any further. Well, it's believed by many Bible scholars that Jesus wrote in the dust to fulfill Jeremiah's prophecy, which they would have known. And as Lynn read it, I'll read it again. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the dirt, for they have, not, they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Remember, he called himself that in the previous chapter, the fountain of living water. That those who forsake God, which is spiritual adultery, will be written in the dust. All of the accusers were guilty of having forsaken God, the fountain of living water, and yet were so anxious to stone this woman to death. Now I wonder, did Jesus write the names of each of the accusers as a sign of judgment against them? Or have, perhaps he wrote that scripture from Jeremiah in the dirt in front of their eyes, pointing to their hypocrisy. It's a riddle, isn't it? But Jesus often speaks and spoke figuratively in parables or in veiled language, as Jamie Vester brought up last Sunday when he was preaching here. Jesus speaks in any way he chooses to grab our attention. Even car number plates, because I can remember a long time, some time ago, I was praying for a, one of our children. We had three boys, and it was not uncommon them, for them to be roaring up the drive in cars. Chain, they often changed in rapid succession. But this particular evening, one drove up from work in a different car. But the first thing I saw was the number plate, LK15. Was Luke 15. The Lord had spoken to me. It was just, that's the story of the prodigal son returned to the father. And I knew it was God speaking to me very plainly. So I'd say, whatever the sign written in the dust performed in light of that prophecy, these accusers are convicted. And it says that each one of them, beginning with the oldest, walks away and leaves Jesus and the woman alone. I think it's interesting, the eldest, the eld eldest could have been her father, who historically would have thrown the first stone. The Torah or Jewish law required two witnesses. There were none. So when Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. Now here, the Aramaic contains a powerful testimony from this woman. Apparently, she had the revelation of who Jesus really was, for she addressed Jesus in the Aramaic Maya, the divine name of Lord Yahweh in the language of the day. And in Corinthians 12, 3, the Bible says that no one can say Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through him or her. I think that's amazing. And so Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That encounter with Jesus changed everything for this woman. Jesus didn't condemn her. But he didn't release her either to go back to her lifestyle and the choices that she had made up to that point. That day, I believe, Jesus demonstrated three important things. One, 
the hypocrisy of a double standard. Since this woman had been caught in the very act, surely these religious zealots knew who the man was too. There's no man around. And yet Leviticus and Deuteronomy both state that if a man is found sleeping with a woman, another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must be stoned to death. So where was he? And according to the New Testament uh, scholar Louise Shotroff, every legal system of antiquity threatens women whose sexuality is the possession of either her father or her husband with severe punishment of death in the case of adultery or premarital intercourse. So the Jewish leaders had already disregarded the law by arresting the woman without the man. And as we said before, the leaders were using the woman as a trap so they could trick Jesus. Because they said if, if Jesus said the woman should not be stoned, they'd accuse him of violating Moses' law. And if he urged them to execute her, they would report him to the Romans, who wouldn't allow the Jews to carry out their own executions. So, and isn't there still, there's still a double standard today, I think, isn't there, that looks down on a woman because of her past, while excusing a man, saying he's just, uh, what is it, sowing his wild oats. Point two, who alone is qualified to judge? Jesus came as a mediator between God and humanity, and all through the Gospels we see that he intervened whenever he encountered the dark forces of sickness, demonic possession, religious distortion, and oppression. He was able to negotiate that religious double talk of the law experts as he brilliantly arbitrated with astounding wisdom. And even before he rose from the grave, he rose to every occasion to lift others up. So when Jesus was confronted with this accused woman, he rose up because he discerned the religious leaders had brought her to trick and trap him. They were twisting God's words into an instrument of judgment. In this challenge, he discerned the real issue, and he spoke light into their darkened hearts. But as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Who was the only sinless one there that day? Jesus. So he alone is qualified to judge. The public humiliation and shame that woman must have felt was heaped back on, the, on her accusers in divine vindication. Payback. Big time. And we see the Pharisees are always tense, spoiling for a fight. Jesus is calm. He's always calm and relaxed throughout. He accepts the woman openly and lovingly as an adult and a person. He can handle the situation with her because he's got nothing to be afraid of himself. Final point three, any of us can rise above our past. Good news, I say to that. <laughs> Jesus bent down. He waited until all the accusers were gone and he rose to his feet again. And he stood up and said to a woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. These words could be rephrased, go, and because you've had an encounter with me, an encounter with Jesus, you can rise above your past. St. Augustine said, God's grace always seems to startle the religious. Jesus empowered her to walk sinless in the light of her future, the very thing she could never do while still trapped and tethered to that dark condemnation of her past. Go and sin no more. No berating, no leak. He didn't give her a lecture. No standover, humiliating tactics. No shaming and blaming. How simple. 
and he addressed her as you. She's no longer an object. Through unconditional forgiveness, she's able to enter into a relationship with Jesus, and on the basis of that relationship, Jesus can challenge her to sin no more. From this moment on, see, from this moment on, the encounter with Jesus, she is, she's offered the possibility of a new life, a new physical life, and the life of a right relationship with Jesus, with God. You know, Jesus just overflows with both truth and tender mercy. And as an encounter with that woman changed her life, I believe that it has changed, that encounter has changed my life. I believe it must have changed yours too. And it still can. So to conclude, there's a beautiful, delicate balance between Jesus' justice, he's just, and not condoning the sin, and his mercy toward the woman. Jesus' love has no agenda. The gentleness with which he treated her and he affirmed her value is absolutely beautiful. Those words hang there, don't they? They hang there now for me, as I imagine they did for the woman, because the words go and sin no more haunt me as I think about myself and how easily I can fall into sinful attitudes and stumble. It would be so much easier if he hadn't tagged those five words on to the end of the story. How about you? You know, Jesus is so gentle, full of mercy, and consistently kind. But for us to enjoy him, we must know him. And the more we know him, the more we love him. The more we want to know him, because he's the lover of our souls, isn't he? And finally, I believe... The Holy Spirit is inviting anyone here, if you don't know Jesus as the lover of your soul, as your Lord and Saviour, to invite him into your life right now. And I'd love to just to say a prayer. And if that's you, just say this prayer um, silently. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life. I believe you died for me and that your blood pays for my sins. I now turn from everything I know is wrong. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. By faith, I receive that gift and I acknowledge you as my Lord and Saviour. Amen. And if you did pray that prayer, I know God is faithful and he will come into your heart by the power of, your Holy, of his Holy Spirit. And if that's you, you tell somebody about it after. Come, come tell me too. Thank you, Kathy, uh, for sharing.